Okay, so now we uh, kind of ended with temperature and talking about climate and things like that. Now we're getting into water relations and how animals and plants deal with water and variations within, um, you know, fluctuating water levels. So organisms, of course, are generally affected by their climate, which a big part of their climate, of course, is the amount of um, moisture in the air called humidity, um, and also, of course, by the temperature, how hot it is, how cold it gets, and so on. Um, they are specifically affected, of course, by concentration gradients of their microclimate. So even within the shade, it's going to be a lower temperature. Um, they may find areas where there is more or less moisture. Um, and the example given in the book is of an experiment done on the cicada to figure out how it is able to develop um, a, a system for cooling despite being in such very, very hot environments. So the content, the first thing we have to talk about is the water within the air. So water will evaporate and become water vapor and become a, a gaseous form. Um, and if, a wa if air is very humid, then the water in the air can reduce a water loss um, through um, less evaporation. So if there's more water in the air, more water vapor, then evaporation occurs less. So a measurement of that is called relative humidity, which is a percentage. That's the amount of water that's in the air compared to the amount of water that can be in the air. So it's a percentage. And we have a little graph there. 95% relative humidity, almost um, all of the water that can be held in the air is in the air, whereas at 10% relative humidity, you have hardly any water in the air compared to how much it could hold. Um, so the, the equation then is the water vapor density divided by the saturation water vapor density um, times 100 will give you that percentage. But it doesn't tell you the total amount of water in the air because relative humidity changes depending on the temperature. So water vapor density then tells you exactly how much water is in the air, and that's the mass of water vapor per vo volume of air. Whereas satura saturation wa wa uh, water vapor density is the total amount of air water air can hold, and it increases with temperature. So you have this um, graph here, and you can see the saturated vapor density at different temperatures and it increases as the temperature increases. So warmer air can hold more water. So 100% humidity at uh, 10 degrees Celsius is only 9.4 uh, grams per meter cube, but that may be similar, let's say, to, um, so let's say 100% humidity at 10 is gonna be like, let's say 5% humidity at 104 okay same amount of water but it's affected by the heat um, total atmospheric pressure is the total amount of pressure exerted by all gases in the air so there are a bunch of different gases most of them are nitrogen but there's oxygen carbon dioxide and other things um, and it fluctuates according to sea level so the because the closer you are to the center of the earth the greater the effect of gravity so total our Atmospheric pressure includes water vapor and all those other gases in the air. And it's measured in torr or in millimeters per mercury or pascals. And a pascal is one newton of force per square meter. Um, so at sea level, the total partial atmospheric pressure is 760 millimeters of mercury or about 101.3 kilopascals. So the pressure of water vapor in the air that is saturated with water in, is the saturation water vapor pressure. And it increases with temperature. And the vapor pressure deficit, or the difference between the actual water vapor pressure and the saturation water vapor um, at a particular temperature. And this is going to affect organisms because the difference then between their internal um, you know, partial pressure, 
partial pressure of water and evaporation is going to um, increase or the loss due to evaporation is going to increase if there's um, very uh, high vapor pressure deficit um, and then a low vapor pressure deficit is going to decrease the amount of evaporation as you can see in that figure. So water movement in aquatic environments it follows patterns of diffusion and osmosis and as you know from basic biology um, diffusion is the the flow of greater con concentration to lower concentration of, of molecules. Um, osmosis then is the movement of water through a semipermeable membrane and it can be isoosmotic which means the two solutions have the same salinity and there's no movement of water or salts and that's what happens in most um, invertebrates that are found in the sea they just have an isoosmotic environment they are the same in salt and water concentration as their environment or you can be hyperosmotic that's where the solution uh, has a greater concentration of water and lesser salinity. So this fish is in a hyperosmotic environment and water will flow out of the hyperosmotic solution um, and salts will move into that solution. So water will increase and salts will be lost whereas in a hypo, if a, if a fish is in a hypoosmotic solution a solution that has a lesser concentration of water and a greater salinity. Water will flow out of this solution or of this um, organism and salts will flow in. Sorry, water, water flows in and salts will flow out. Alright, so water potential is another way of measure me, measuring um, the loss of water due to plants, okay? Um, and it is abbreviated by this uh, Greek letter psi. So water potential equals the total effect of solute concentrations, which is the effect of osmosis, plus matrix pressure, which is the force of cohesion of two smaller molecules of water, such as in the soil, and the negative pressure of evaporation. Okay, so when you put them all together, that's what it looks like. You have these smaller water potentials, which add up to the total uh, water potential in the plant. It's measured in megapascals and determines the direction of water movement. Essentially, water flows from high potential to a low potential. So the uh, lower the water potential, that's where things are going to flow. And you can see on this... Um, diagram the dry air has a negative 100 potential so that is it is the most negative it is the least um, has has the least water potential um, as you go into the soil the soil is 0.6 so it is negative 0.6 so it is the closest to um, to zero so it is the greatest amount and as you go up the tree, this continues to become more and more negative, so water will flow up the tree. Now, transpiration is the process by which water moves through plants, um, and it's fueled by evaporation by the sun. So water evaporates at the surface of leaves. That happens when stomata are open, and this exerts a negative pressure on the xylem sap, which has water and minerals within the xylem. And this also exerts a pressure for more water and minerals to enter the xylem from the roots. So then there's water in the soil that is then being sucked basically kind of like through a straw into the xylem um, and through the plant. Uh, another name for this transport, transport is called bulk flow and it doesn't require energy other than the energy required by the sun. So what allows water to do this is the, called the cohesion tension hypothesis, which is basically that um, the source of energy uh, for movement of water and minerals through the xylem is that evaporation by the sun. Water is cohesive, so it will stick to itself. So that, that's what gives the water the pulling uh, or suction as it is evaporated. 
Um, and it is also adhesive, so it will stick to the sides of the walls, kind of like in a straw, within the xylem walls. Um, and that will counteract the effects of gravity. So if you look at the structures within a plant, they have these um, pores called stoma, or multiple pores are called stomata, and there is air there, which when the stoma is open, will expose water to evaporation. So that water will evaporate and it will leave the leaf. As it does so, you have xylem filled with water, which now because that water has left, it creates a negative pressure and so that water will flow from the xylem into that air space. Um, and then that connects down the plant into the, um, <coughs> into the roots. Uh, but you have water then sticking to these different um, areas, which is the force of cohesion sticking to the different cells, and of course the water sticking to itself, which is adhesion. Sorry, cohesion is water sticking it to, to itself, adhesion is it sticking to these different cells. Okay, so uh, again, this is kind of reiterating the, the other graph we saw where the soil has the most positive or least negative um, water potential. And you can see as you go up into the roots, to the stem, to the leaves, or to the branches, to the leaves, to the air, it becomes more and more negative. So the water potential is set up for water to move through the plant. All right, so um, when uh, plants and animals evolved the ability to live on terrestrial environments they had to deal with no longer being surrounded by water so they have this balance between water loss and water acquisition that needs to be accounted for so this equation then is um, a matter of water regulation so WIA is the internal water of an animal WD is the drinking water taken by the animal so um, it can find a water source and drink WF and that's always going to be positive. WF then is the water taken in with food. WA is the water absorbed from the air and then you have to subtract the amount of water loss from evaporation and from secretions and excretions such as in urine or defecation. Okay so when you look at um, animals and plants you have all these things going on. Absorption of water from the air, some being lost as evaporation, drink and food being um, uh, eaten and, and drunk and then secretions which are going to lose water there. Um, in plants it's a little bit different so we use the uh, sub letters IP to represent the internal water of a plant um, which is the water taken from the soil by the roots positive, the water absorbed from the air positive, minus the water lost from transpiration and the water lost from secretions and reproductive structures. So for example uh, pl some plants will produce a nectar and a nectar has water within it and it will lose water that way. Um, most animals can drink or absorb water and are, are just fine with that but animals that live in arid climates have uh, th an additional challenge of finding water in a place where it doesn't rain very often. Um, so they can absorb it su such as the example of this beetle which it will dig burrows which will attract water vapor and fog as it comes in um, and also have different ways to reduce water loss. Uh, another source of water is metabolic water which is the byproduct of breaking down food and that's sufficient for some animals such as kangaroo rats. Um, plants on the other hand generally just increase the length of their roots when exposed to areas with decreased uh, amounts of water. Um, and this is true in climate, so in a desert climate, but also in microclimate. So the different areas will have different amounts of moisture in the soil. Um, one with greater soil would expect, or sorry, with greater soil moisture would expect to have smaller roots. So um, one of the ways, if you can't increase the amount of water intake, you can reduce the amount of water lost. So waterproofing is one way in which you can do that. And hydrocarbons, which are repelling water um, by nature, they are lipids, pro are, are produced at the surface, such as waxes in plants. 
and desert plants are also more resistant to desiccation because of this thick um, cuticle layer of wax. You can also concentrate your urine and feces so that they have very little water content. Um, behaviorally, plants <coughs> and animals more than plants can make sure that they are active during times when it is cooler. <coughs> plants will reduce evaporative water loss by reducing their leaf surface area so they can have more pointy leaves. Um, they grow leaves only when it rains so they can go into periods of dormancy and they can produce thicker leaves that have fewer stomata. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> <coughs> they can also do alternative water conserving pathway, pathways which we'll talk about more. So going back to aquatic uh, environments, marine and freshwater organisms have an opposite problem. If you're in the marine environment, you're going to be hyperosmotic. And so that the salt will want to come into your water and your water will want to leave your body. Whereas freshwater organisms <coughs> are hypoosmotic, so salt will want to, um, sorry, water will want to leave their body and salt will want to enter. No, nope, other way around. So they are hypoosmotic, meaning they are more concentrated with solutes. So um, water will want to flow into them and salt will want to flow out. So the equation for our, the aquatic water balance is the internal water of an organism equal the amount of water um, that it drinks uh, minus the water lost by secretion plus or minus the water loss or gained by osmosis. Uh, most invertebrates are isoosmotic, so they don't have to worry about this, but fish are hyperosmotic in marine environments and will lose water to their environment. To balance this, they'll excrete a urine that is very concentrated with solute, so if they do drink water, they can get the water out of there and release all the salts. Freshwater fish are hyperosmotic compared to their environment, and they have plenty of drinking water, um, but they also have to provide a way to keep that water from... Um, increasing their their body mass to where they can no longer function. So they have a very um, dilute urine they with lots of water being excreted and then they also increase salt concentrations by uh, using specialized cells in their gills called chloride cells and also receive some through ingestion of their 